I've said to you at the beginning, a rather impressive market valuation of $15 million for my brand new, still in startup SaaS company. How do you get that? Now, I purposely went out after my first year and paid for a formal assessment of the business to get this valuation. And the reason why is because if you can build a business knowing what makes one excellent from day one, and knowing what makes one high value from day one, you are going to build with a much stronger strategic methodical approach. And you're going to be working on the right things instead of a mad headless chicken, which most of us are in startup phase, right? So I want to give you, these are not all of the things that are assessed when you're having your business valued, but I want to give you a few things to be thinking about. What is it that makes a multi-million dollar business? What is it that makes a sellable business? Because even if you don't plan to sell one day, these things are going to really help you build a very solid business. So they're going to be things like the valuers, buyers, really like monthly recurring revenue. So well done, all of you guys here are either in a business or starting one that requires monthly recurring revenue. That is a repeated bill coming in per month. This instantaneously increases the bottom line, reduces risk, increases sustainability, and makes you look real sexy to those sharks that might like to buy you, or even better, one of your competitors that you are making go, better buy these guys because they're getting too big. All right, that is my goal. Hello, Silicon Valley, big boys, move aside, right? I want my competition to actually eat me. That's what I'm trying to do. Yeah, that's my personal goal. So this is where you're going to be thinking, well, what will make them want to do that? Revenue, monthly recurring. The other thing that's assessed is how much does your monthly recurring revenue increase every single month? So in my first year, we were increasing by 30% every single month. The next month, we grew by another 30% on top of that. The next month, we grew by another 30% on top of that. So increased revenue, growth, massively increases your sellability score. Okay, That's the other thing you want to be thinking about. How can I keep increasing that revenue? The other thing that is very sexy to a buyer, apart from my amazing shoes today, is no churn rate. Does anyone know what, not know what churn means? Anyone not heard of churn? Okay, this is going to be, a lot of people focus on how many subscribers they have, and forget the other really important one is how many people are leaving, churn rate, how many people are leaving. This is really interesting because I had a client come to me once with some coaching and say, Sarah, I don't understand where my money's going. I don't understand what's going on in my business. I'm bringing in hundreds of new subscribers every month, and there's no money. And I said, what's your churn rate? And they went, what? They had just as many people leaving just this giant hole in the bucket, <laughs> right? That is not good. You can have loads and loads of customers coming in, but if you have a high churn rate, whack, whack, things are going to go south very fast. We also want to make sure to have a highly valuable business is that you don't just have one or two massive customers. True story. In 2014, I had a multi-million dollar training company. Those were big, massive corporates and a government client. And every single one of them were funded by one government fund. On a single Tuesday morning, nine months into a 19-month contract, I lost $2.7 million and 21 employees because the fund ceased early. That, my friends, is a very bad day. All right? I drank a few wines that night. <laughs> so, that was character building. So this again here is where a highly sellable business, a low-risk business, is one that has as many clients as possible. Preferably, as many clients as possible that are not dependent on one particular industry as possible. And in particular, again, one that's not reliant on one particular geographical location. We've heard of bushfires, right? If you are just in that local area, I know we've talked about locality being a great way to niche, but imagine if every single buyer in that particular geographical region cannot buy tomorrow. That's interesting, isn't it? We need to make sure that we are creating as bulletproof a business as we possibly can. So for me, I have niched in my industry, course creators. That's my background, education, right? However, it's any course creator in any industry in any country in the world. So you can see here how niching doesn't necessarily have to be the thing, the people, the geographical location. It can be the part of the product or the feature that you promote. Yeah, you can get smart with how do I niche? Is it a particular audience avatar? No. Is it a particular 
thing that they do, maybe. Is it just a particular feature But anyone? There's no rules to that. Start thinking. Now, the other thing as well that we have to do is if anyone or anything in your business has to go through you before it gets done, work, work, you have yourself a high-risk business that not many people are going to want to buy. All right? If my plane didn't make it here tomorrow, <laughs> I am pleased to say that my business would carry on without me. If you have a business that is dependent on you or a couple of key individuals, high-risk business, and you need to start today on your to-do list writing down ways of how can I make myself redundant. Right? The quicker you can make yourself the most useless, redundant person in your business, the richer and happier you're going to become. Now, what I don't mean by that is completely stepping away from it altogether. As we've seen, our founders of High Level here today are very much accessible to their community. And that connection, that human touch, is so powerful in building your business and building your brand. But in that, you do not have to be there in terms of the thing to run, in terms of the lights being able to stay on. Have you given people in your business a delegation of authority? What does that mean? Can they spend your money without having to wait for you to say yes or no? And if so, how much? Even my VAs on $5 an hour have a delegation of authority. They are approved without having to ask anybody to authorize a refund of a month's subscription, completely from their own initiative. Right? They don't have to ask anybody. So nobody is holding up that customer experience element. And let's face it, somebody not getting their money back when they've asked for it can be a PR disaster that will cost you a heck of a lot more than a month's subscription on anything.